Our next speaker is Claudio, a uh, BC hacker who's been all over network stack and now is attacking storage uh, with ice uh, ice demons the open BC way. So take it away, Claudio. <laughs> so um, good day, everybody. Um, I'm gonna talk about iSCSI-D and uh, vSCSI, um, or <sighs> okay, I'm moving over here. Um, and vSCSI, uh, the device that actually makes it possible to actually build this uh, iSCSI initiator. Um, all of this more or less started in 2009, so it's actually quite a long time ago. Um, and uh, I decided to actually do a talk about this now because I finally think um, iSCSI D is, is, in my opinion, production ready. As, um, I'm running it now on my private server and uh, I have no issue with it. So this is why I'm talking about it now. So um, what will we cover uh, or what will I cover? Um, first of all, I will give a little bit of an introduction what iSCSI is. Um, I will talk about vSCSI, our virtual SCSI controller, um, and how he, that one is used to actually build up iSCSI D, um, which is uh, the initiator implementation that we had now have in, uh, in OpenBSD. And uh, the last point is actually the magic needed to actually be able to boot uh, and shut down um, with iSCSI in, in the whole set. Um, so what is iSCSI? Uh, it's, in short, it's SCSI over the internet. Um, there are two RFCs um, that more or less cover the base protocol. Um, it was mainly designed as a cheap solution for, for SANS because um, everything that was fiber channel was extremely expensive. Um, it also was uh, the idea that you actually could reuse an already available network infrastructure. Um, so if you already have a lot of Ethernet, ports uh, and, and all the technology around, you can actually use I, um, iSCSI much easier than you can do the same thing with um, Fiber Channel. Um, it's network disk storage, so it's block access. It's not a network file system. Um, for that, we have NFS and SMB and some other uh, things like AFS. Um, what is SCSI? So, SCSI is the small computer systems interface. It's really old. Um, it is a protocol to access whatever I.O. devices there are. So it started with disks, then CD-ROM, uh, CD tape drives, scanners. There was um, even the possibility to actually have Ethernet over SCSI. So mm, you could actually start doing everything over it. Um, there is also various physical implementations of SCSI. So at the beginning, it was parallel SCSI um, in various forms. Then there was SAS introduced as uh, serial attached SCSI, uh, fiber channel, IEEE 3094, uh, Firewire. Um, the USB uh, um, mass storage is normally um, using SCSI as, as a, a transport encapsulation. Um, there is even software emulations as uh, in OpenBSD, um, our um, SADA and uh, RAID controllers are actually showing up as SCSI disks, even so they're probably not. So the, the, the driver itself is then actually translating these SCSI commands into the native uh, either seal um, ATA commands or for the RAID controllers in their um, whatever kind of... Um, uh, messages they need to actually talk to the actual block devices behind it. So that's a SCSI device, and that's a SCSI device. SCSI itself is a request response protocol. Um, there is multiple targets normally. A target is either like a disk or, or can be like a chassis or whatever. Um, there are normally, uh, or it's possible to have actually multiple logical units. Um, those are then the so-called, uh, there is normally an identifier for them, the LUN, the logical unit number. 
Um, these are, um, and uh, the initiator is more or less at the beginning trying to discover all these LUNs and then is able to address them by these log logical unit numbers. Um, the initiator sends these command structures to the target. Um, people normally come the, call them the command descriptor blocks. Um, they have the, the information in it. It's like this is a read, this is a write, this is a discovery, and, and all this information. Um, the communication, this is important, I think, is always initiated by the initiator. This is why it's called initiator. It's quite logical. Um, the this is a little bit different to, s to some other protocols, and I think it's, it, uh, it um, simplifies things, but it, it also makes other stuff harder, because it's not really easy for a target to like, um, send something to the, to the, to the initiator to, to indicate an error or something. Um, iSCSI, what iSCSI is doing, it more or less like packs all these SCSI transfers and everything that's normally on, on, on either the, the, the serial line or the parallel lines of, of, a, of a, a SCSI chain, it packs it into TCP streams. Um, there is more or less a one-to-one -one mapping of uh, a TCP session to a logical unit number or actually a nice SCSI session to a logical unit number. Um, so every disk um, that you export through iSCSI normally has its own session. Um, it's possible to actually have multiple sessions, uh, multiple connections per session. Um, I have not really found all that many um, systems that actually provide that, but it's actually possible. And it would actually give you more performance and, and, and error resilience because um, you would be able to actually issue multiple commands at the same time. There is um, a important part is also the authentication and cap uh, capability negotiation. So when the, uh, when the session is established, there is um, a handshake going on, figuring out who can provide what kind of features. Um, this is the iSCSI connection state machine. Um, by default, you're either in free, as in the session is unused, or you're logged in. All the other states are just there to actually handle um, the connection setup, which is going through here, or actually error recovery, which is all these various states over there. So um, a lot of the complexity of, of iSCSI is actually coming from um, handling error conditions. So what happens if the TCP connection is, is, is turned down because uh, there is like a, a problem with the, with the Ethernet or whatever. Um, so what, how do you re recover from these things? How can you still be uh, guaranteeing the reliability that SCSI has, that, uh, that, that like a, a, a command is issued and actually is finished? Um, and there is various ways of actually handling uh, these error uh, cases. And interestingly, most um, systems that I know are implementing very simple error recoveries, as in normally they just abort all the transactions, say uh, this didn't work out, and hope that the kernel then actually redoes the command as a, a second time. Um, so iSCSI goes over TCP. It normally uses port uh, 3260. Um, there are 18 message types defined. Um, of these eight, eight, 18 message types, there are five that are actually SCSI, uh, SCSI specific. Um, there are eight messages for session and task configuration. And then there is a little bit of, of uh, special messages that are also going a little bit in this, in this uh, session handling. Um, two of them are not messages, more or less, that you can like ping pong and see if this, uh, the session is still alive. And, and the uh, asynchronous messages are for, for error handling. So the bulk of the messages are actually not about transporting data. They're actually about bringing sessions up, bringing sessions down, extending sessions, and all these things. Um, there is also funny that the, the base RFC already defines 22 various buttons that you can push and, and twiddle and, and, and tune 
and hope that actually you get better performance or worse performance or that you can interrupt with the device and, and things like this. So it's, it's, there is a lot of, of various code passes that you need to try out. And um, that was a, a, a issue for a long time in the beginning is that um, if you actually had, uh, if, if the, 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 at the beginning I had an issue in, in, the, in, the, in this, in this um, negotiation of these, of these options, and it can happen that you're actually talking to another side, and it actually seems to work, but then suddenly you're sending a message that was a little bit too big or something like that, and, and, and suddenly nothing worked anymore. So it's, it's, um, it didn't make it easy to actually have all these, these, these options to, to tune, um, and it sometimes would be easier to actually simplify, have a simpler base version that, that you can implement easier. So, um, now let's talk about vSCSI. vSCSI is our virtual um, SCSI controller. It more or less exposes the SCSI bus or the SCSI subsystem to the user land. Um, this means the user land actually then has to implement what would be a SCSI controller. Um, in our case, this is the iSCSI initiator, uh, which is then transporting these, these SCSI messages to the other side where then the actual controller is sitting and, and is then doing all the work. So it's, it's um, for us, it's actually, for iSCSI, this is just a handing, handling stuff, like moving information in and out. But it would also be possible to, to create a, a user land SCSI controller that talks to a, a local file. Uh, as an example, if you want to do like some crazy uh, um, encrypted disk storage or something like that, this would, would be a possibility. Um, the the kernel passes in, in 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 passes the SCSI commands um, from the, the mid layer to the user land through this vSCSI interface. Um, this means the, the 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 SCSI disk from the kernel is creating a SCSI command, issues it into the mid layer, and then the mid layer um, delivers it to vSCSI, which then queues it and 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 transports it up to the to, to user land by um, by a fairly simple interface. Um, so it is all IOCTL based. Um, it doesn't have any read or write function, which is a little bit funky, but uh, it makes sense for, for this device. Um, there is six IOCTLs, um, and they're mostly there to, first of all, DQ the SCSI command. Then there is, is uh, one IOCTL to actually send back the, the response message of this SCSI command. There is uh, two IOCTLs that are there to read and write data. Um, and then there is the, the two last commands which are necessary to, to probe and detach SCSI's devices from, from vSCSI and from the, the SCSI bus uh, of the kernel so that we can actually um, if you if you uh, if you remove a session in iSCSI D, it actually then would um, detach it from the kernel, and by that, the disk would then actually disappear um, and no longer be available. Um, it's also interesting that the the, the vSCSI data read and write commands um, need to be looked at from the the view of the device or of the of the the disk device or the disk device driver actually so if i'm writing to the disk this is a vSCSI data write um and if i'm reading from the disk it's a uh, vSCSI data read so it's it's um it's a little bit reverse from what you would expect um from the the user land side because i'm actually i'm calling read but i'm um I have to pass in data on the read. So it's, it's, uh, the naming is a bit funky. Uh, here is an example how you would uh, talk to vSCSI in a very simple driver. Um, first of all, you need to, to uh, create all these various um, IOCTL structures. Um, you 
then do a, a, a probe request, which um, more or less you, you specify the target. You're normally using LUN0 because uh, this is the first uh, ID per target, and, and you, you tell the kernel, like, probe me this device. Um, the kernel will then start actually issuing um, vSCSI I2T commands to, to do the discovery. So uh, this is then the next thing that actually actually happens. You're, you're, you're getting the vSCSI I2T command, um, and then you're actually looking at this, this command structure, and, and by looking at it, you actually start to know what it is, if it's a, if it's a write command or if it's a, a read command. Um, and then based on that, you can then um, do various things. So here, this is, a, this is the write case. So we, we're, we're seeing that it's a write command. We're actually allocating the memory that we need to actually fulfill this write command. We then um, do the IOCTL to get all this data, because the write data is already p uh, uh, available from the kernel. So we're getting all this data out, and, and then would send it to our, our write function and, and clean up. In the case of a read, it's, it's actually the, um, a little bit different because here we know, oh, okay, actually I want to read something. Um, so I first actually get the data. I'm reading the data. I'm filling out the, 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 the tag information so that we actually can still... Um, the, the, the tag is important to, to, um, to bind all these various commands together. So the I2T at the beginning gives me a tag and I need to tag all my messages that is part of this command with the same tag so that the kernel can then um, build stuff together. Because it's actually possible to do multiple reads um, to finish a one command. And once it's finished, then I'm, 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 I'm then, as a last um, step, I'm doing the T2Y um, IOCTL to tell it, now the command is finished and, and, and let's go on. Um, so. This is, uh, this is the read case. We're reading the data in. We're filling out the, the, the buffers that we then pass in in the IOCTL, and, and by that, the kernel gets the information. Um, at the end, we're finishing the IOCTL. Uh, we, we're finishing the command by the T2I IOCTL. Um, there it is again, similar. We, we have to tell it the, the tag, um, what was, um, which command it was. And we need to um, we give him back the the status if it was if the transaction was successful or if there was an error condition, and uh, by that we more or less uh, give the kernel the the feedback what what goes on. And uh, the last example is more or less like how you detach a disk. It's very similar to to actually attaching to it. You tell the target, you tell the the logical unit number, and you call the vSCSI detach function. And with this, you're actually able to more or less do everything that you need to do with this, with the this SCSI device. Um, so, where are we there, and what is needed? Um, the SCSI is actually pretty much finished. There is, there is. Um, it's actually funny um, when I was doing this slide um, two days later, there were two commits to VSCSI. <laughs> so the no recent changes were is is a little bit of a lie, but it actually works and it does the job well. Um, Sometimes it would be nice to actually support multiple vSCSI consumers. Um, it would be nice to actually be able to, uh, to run maybe like uh, two iSCSI Ds at the same time, one on, 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 on the vSCSI 0 device and one on the vSCSI 1 device, so that uh, you could restart one while the other one is still keeping up a, a second connection to your same disk. And, and then using the multi-pass um, features of our kernel to actually um, being able to, to restart daemons and, and things like that, and not losing, l losing connection in the meantime. Um, sometimes I had the feeling that it would be nice to actually have uh, proper blocking I.O. modes and, and use like read and writes and things, but uh, I came more or less to the conclusions that the I.O. controls will actually work very well. Um, we're we're using in ASCSID, we're, we're using uh, libevent anyway, so, so uh, everybody is polling or KQing, and, and that makes it um, not necessary to actually do any kind of blocking, blocking IO mode. 
the, tri the, the idea here is more or less that um, you pull until um, you get an I2T command from, from the kernel that more or less starts the whole initiation of, of uh, getting some data or writing some data. Um, so why did we start with iSCSI-D? Um, we're definitely not the first ones doing an iSCSI initiator. Um, I know that FreeBSD has an in-kernel initiator. Um, the time I started at that time, NetBSD um, was working on a userland initiator using Refuse or a, a generic um, iSCSI implementation using, using Fuse and Refuse. Um, but as far as I know, they actually now also have an in-kernel initiator. Um, we think we can do better, or um, as I would normally say, we are trying to do a simpler implementation. Um, we wanted to have less kernel code, so less um, pa parsing of messages or anything in the kernel. Um, privilege dropping, like not, not having to use super user for anything. Um, all these things about what OpenBSD is normally about. Um, and yeah, we are also having, um, I'm, I'm saying here a mild form, but sometimes it's not really mild form of not invented here syndrome. Um, now, what it is not. It is not yet another OSPF or BGPD clone um, that uses multiple processes and sends iMessages back and forth and all these, ma um, these fancy things that we have copied in many demons now. Um, but it uses some parts of it. So we have a control socket, we have an iSCSI CTL pr uh, command, um, but we're not really using iMessages where it's, it's done a little bit easier and a little bit different. Um, it's also not necessary to have multiple uh, processes because we can just change root and privilege drop and, and everything is fine. So um, you only need the uh, super user uh, rights to actually open the, the, the vSCSI device. And, and after, you, after you've done that, it's, it's done. You, can, you, you don't have to do anything anymore. Um, we can change root away, we can drop the privileges, and, and uh, that's it. There is no no need to do stuff like DNS resolving or, or anything other that's, that's, um, that would need to actually be outside of the, of the change route. And um, one of the tricks that we did is actually that the, the whole config parsing is done by the iSCSI control program and then passed through the, the control socket to the daemon. So the daemon doesn't need to reload the config and actually keep, um, keep a way to actually read that file. Um, open, so, so the, the change would actually work. Yeah, uh, the reconnect is... Hmm? Um, he was asking how we are handling the reconnects. So reconnects are in a way simple because we actually don't do uh, DNS lookup. So the config that we're getting from iSCSI CTL only has IP addresses. So on the reconnect, we just, uh, we just open the socket, bind, uh, bind and connect, and, and, and uh, get a new session. No. No, we don't do that. Um, this may be something to think about, but at the moment, it's, it's not done. It's also a little bit... Um, the it doesn't make sense to drop the the limits to a to a minimum because you actually don't know if there is more sessions coming in. Like if you afterwards reconfigure your iSCSI um, command, uh, if you change your iSCSI config to actually open up m more sessions, you would not be able to do that. So um, at the moment, we just allow it to to have as many FDs open as it wants, or at least. Um, what's the hard limit of the system is at the moment. Um, the good thing is, and, and, and um, this is why we have vSCSI, is it actually reduces iSCSI to very simple tasks. So um, for iSCSI, it means um, that the, the messages coming from the kernel are completely black boxes. I'm never looking at 
um, at what actually the kernel sends me. I'm just taking it, packing it into TCP, and sending it off. So the, the impact on the kernel is, is extremely minimal. So the vSCSI code itself is about 600 lines of code and, and, and is, is extremely simple. Um, and iSCSI itself is also fairly simple because um, it's only responsible for, for very simple tasks. So it needs to have this, the session and the connection find its state machines. It needs to make sure that it can open the connections. It packs and unpacks the SCSI messages, and, and that's it. It's, it's, it tries to be as simple as possible. Um, it also probably is the reason why I actually was able to write this thing, because I have no idea how SCSI itself as a protocol works. I have it now, after, after years of, 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 of working a bit around with it, I, I have a bit of a better feeling, but I'm, I'm definitely not a, a, a SCSI expert. That's, um, that's for David, um, who also wrote the vSCSI implementation. He probably knows way more about SCSI than I do. Um, the important thing here is, is iSCSID actually has to handle a lot of data copying in and out, and, and, and so the buffer management is somewhat important. Um, the idea was that uh, the, the iSCSI messages are very, very well structured, also because of uh, the idea of being able to use RDMA and, and, and other techniques. So um, they normally have um, well-defined sizes and stuff. So the buffer management in iSCSID is based on the idea how a PDU is, is, is built up. Um, the goal is that we don't copy data more around that we actually need. Um, this is the, we're already copying a lot of data from the kernel to userland and back, and, and so we want to try to not copy it in userland around just for fun. Um, and in the end, it, 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 the idea was that we actually also have a, a, an easier data management, but um, I think that's normally always a goal. The, on, on the right, we have the, the more or less the SCSI message format on, on the wire. So we have at the top, we have like the basic, the basic header, which is always present. This is this 48 byte thing that's always there. Then there is a possible optional additional header segment, which has additional stuff in it. Um, this is especially uh, used uh, during um, capability negotiation and, and similar things. Uh, then there are, is, is a header digest that is more or less a, a, a checksum over the basic header and additional header. Then a, a data segment that can be around if you're, if you're actually passing data in and out, uh, if you're, if you're, if, um, and, and the data di digest. Um, there is a lot of things that are optional, and, um, and for uh, iSCSI D, we're actually not using the, the digest fields as an example. There are, there, um, the plan is there, uh, they are um, defined, but we're, we're not using them at all. So um, the idea what I came up is I, I, I looked a little bit at, at how um, the vectorized IO um, commands work, and, and I was trying to use them heavily for this. So, um, and, and this is why struct PDU was also built similar to it. So it, it consists of uh, five um, segments of data that then more or less combined give you the, the iSCSI message. And by that I can use one write uh, command or one read command to, do, to send one packet uh, at a time. As I already said, um, most transfer are initiated by the initiator. So um, especially once everything is, is up and running, um, it's, it's just the initiator sending, or actually our kernel giving commands and, and, and passing them all the way over and, 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 and um, waiting until like a command is finished. So iSCSID, um, Always, al it, it always starts with the I2T message. Um, the, 
this is the first thing that comes in, and based on that, um, iSCSI D then, then starts to transfer. It, it allocates the PDU buffers that are necessary. It, 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 it does the, the, the scheduling of the task. It assigns, it assigns the, the, um, the command to a, a certain session or, or, or connection and, and then starts running it. Um, this is more or less how it, it, it roughly looks like. So at the beginning, we have this I.O. event coming in. Um, and then um, iSCSI D does this uh, vSCSI I2T command. Um, in this case, this is a read operation. So it's, it's, uh, I, uh, it tells me direction read. Um, I'm creating the iSCSI D creates then the PDU, assigns it to a, to a task, queues it on the task. Um, which is, is part of the session. Then uh, the, the scheduler more or less um, decides which connection actually is available, puts it onto this connection, um, and then it actually starts sending the SCSI request over the wire to the target, and the target then prepares um, everything um, and starts sending then the SCSI data in commands over back, um, which then are translated by by ASCSID in the vSCSI data read uh, IOCTLs. So this is more or less where the data is actually then moving, moving back. And then at the end, uh, the status is coming back. And uh, first of all, we're, we're, closing, we're closing the command um, for vSCSI and, and the SCSI subsystem. So we're sending the vSCSI T2I command. And we're cleaning up the task um, inside ASCSID. For write, this is, uh, is similar, but a um, is a bit different. Um, so it, it starts more or less the same way. It's a write, but uh, then um, we're sending the, the request. This is, this is now a, a, a non-immediate write operation. Um, so in this case, we're actually sending the SCSI request and saying, uh, we're going to write to you now. And uh, then the, the server more or less sends back, like, yes, I'm ready. You can start writing. And then I'm, I'm fetching the data, sending the data to the, to the other end, um, and uh, getting, getting uh, normally, like, you can send more data now, more data now, until all the data has been sent over, um, if it was a very large buffer. And um, at the end, again, if everything is finished, we get the status. Um, we do the vSCSI T2I, and we close the task. There is, there is also a few shortcuts, because as you see, there is a lot of round trips going on here. Um, by, by using some of the buttons that in, the, in the configuration options, um, you actually can do an immediate write. That means uh, once you get the, the, the vSCSI I2T that, that it is a write, you can immediately do a, 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 um, the, a data write part of, of, of the, the initial SCSI request, you can include already a, a, a bunch of data um, that, uh, that you then can send with it over the wire. So in, in the end, if the buffer is small enough, you can actually do just one round trip. So you would, you would just send it over to the, to, to, the, to the target with the data already in it, and then more or less it, you just get the status back. So it's, it's much, much less work to do. Um, But as, as I said, because there is multiple ways of doing it, you also need to more or less implement all the ways of doing it. So where are the problems with the startup? Um, at the moment, iSCSID can only provide non-boot disks. This is important. Um, this is necessary because it actually needs, needs running network, and it needs to have a... Uh, a running user land because it's actually a user land daemon. Um, this means you need to have at least um, init and RC already running, so you're somewhere between single user mode and, and being completely fully multi user. Um, you need to have, in, in, in our case at the moment, uh, root and user need to be mounted because uh, iSCSID is in user as been at the moment, but it would be possible to actually make it. Um, a static, um, a static binary, and move it to the to the root partition. So you actually could be um, mounting user of of iSCSI. Um, 
in my opinion, it's not really the biggest issue um, because uh, you can easily um, boot off local disks normally off on, on servers uh, or you're using uh, NFS to do a, a network file boot to at least get the root file system with, with uh, root and user. Um, the, the actual tricky bits are that um, even so you're actually starting to mount additional stuff very late in, in, in the boot up process, you still need to make sure that you're reliably um, checking and mounting the, the, the iSCSI re um, exported file systems. So if there was an unclean shutdown, what needs to be happening is, is that the file system check is running, and while the file system check is running, no other demons are starting up because they may actually depend on the file systems that iSCSI provides to be, to be already mounted. So um, <coughs> this was a little bit of, a, of, a, of a, uh, something we had to figure out, how we're going to do this. Um, we came up with a somewhat easy way of doing it. Um, we already had uh, a, a point um, because of, of, of how NFS works. It, it was fairly similar. You, you normally mount um, the local disks first and then do a afterwards actually remount everything, uh, even the network devices, once the network was up and running. So we just modified there a little bit around to um, before we're doing the second mount of all the disks, uh, the mount minus A, we, we, um, we added another fi uh, file system check run that actually checks the iSCSI provided disks. Um, then we, we extended uh, FS tab mount and file system check um, so that they, they more or less have a better understanding what file systems are provided by, on, are only available if, if we actually have network running. So FSTAB now has a net option similar to the no auto option to more or less indicate this file system is only available if we have network. And uh, mount and file system check then have now a, a, an additional minus N argument that tells them to only, um, if, if, they're, if they're run with big minus capital N, um, they're only, th then they will only exclusively check the net file system, so everything that has um, uh, a net in it. Um, if they are not run with, with capital N, they actually ignore all the net lines. This is not completely perfect at the moment, especially when fa uh, file system check needs manual intervention, but it works good enough to actually be, be um, uh, reliable. On shutdown, the stuff was a little bit more tricky, at, at least I thought so at the beginning. So init kills all user land processes before, before it sinks disks. That means we're killing iSCSI before we actually flush the file system. So we were never able to actually shut down a machine or reboot. Um, that's not good. And especially then with, with uh, our multi-plus uh, support, what actually happened was the file system disappeared, but the kernel was still having dirty buffers. And then it was just waiting <coughs> and hoping that the disk will re um, reappear again. And this never happened because iSCSID was gone. So there were two options of how we could handle it. We could try to unmount the disk before um, iSCSID is killed, or we keep iSCSID running until the disks are synced. Then at the beginning, I was like, yeah, this, the second option will never work. But I did a quick test. Um, I, I went into um, our kill code and more or less had a magic thing in it that just said, if the command is iSCSID, just don't send it kill signals. Um, so you, you had an unkillable iSCSID and did a shutdown. And funnily enough, the file system was clean when I booted up the system again. So this seems to work. Um, so it's good enough to actually just keep iSCSID running um, on shutdown and then 
uh, on reboot, everything is fine. So what, we, what, what I did then is I added a process flag to indicate that process should not be killed by kill min minus one, which um, init is using to kill everything. And um, iSCSID more or less sets this no broadcast kill flag on startup, and by that, everything is, is, is fine. Um, the funny thing is this, this, this idea of, of having processes that, that keep alive even during the shutdown phase uh, could help to, to keep some other processes even running for longer. So it would be possible to have like syslogd more or less being running in the system until to the end, like to the dying gasp of the machine. So um, this, this um, may be something that we will do um, in OpenBSD. Yeah, it's, it, the thing is, um, the kernel actually forces the unmount at the end. So, so he just goes and, and, and uses the big hammer to, to just close all the file descriptors. So it actually works. It, you may not, you not, may not get all the, the messages, but you will get more messages because syslogd will be killed last. So you will get all the, the kill messages from all the other demons that, that you killed beforehand. We don't really have, like, what we can do is we can, we can uh, kill minus one, uh, like, you can uh, kill, y you can go to single user mode, but it was, will also kill all the user land processes. Um, we don't really have a system where you can go and, and selectively say, kill everything that uses this and this file system. We don't, we don't have um, support for that. Um, in the end, what is what still needs to be done. Um, I think uh, there is still need to actually clean up the, the code a bit more. Um, the file system machine, uh, finite state machine that I was using is a bit funky. I, I wrote most of the code in about four days or something during a hackathon and, and uh, it has some, some strange ways of, of, of how messages are being passed back and forth. Um, there is still a few extensions that we don't really support. Um, I would really like to test multi-connection support. Um, I think our initiator actually supports it, but I haven't found any target that actually does more than one connection per, per session, so that's, uh, that's a bit sad. Maybe, maybe I need to find some really expensive gear that actually supports it. And uh, then uh, long term, um, there is definitely the idea to actually not have to copy in data copy the data in and out of the kernel all the time. So um, passing, passing the messages in the kernel, keep them in the kernel, and, and maybe even do RDMA. Funnily enough, um, on my laptop, uh, using local, uh, us using the loopback, I'm actually able to do about uh, 160 megabytes per second mm, through iSCSID. So the speed is actually there, even so we're actually cop copying and uh, copying all the data through user land. Um, that's more or less the last slide. I want to thank David for actually pushing me to write iSCSID and, and providing me vSCSI that actually made it possible. And I also want to thank Theo and Philip for helping me figuring out how to do the startup and shutdown dance. Um, yep. Any questions? Viscosity and iSCSID allow a remote target to communicate with the uh, SCSI subsystem in the kernel. Yep. Uh, what measures are there to prevent the remote target from exporting uh, some book in the kernel? Um, so you want to know what, what prevents us that somebody is, is abusing um, VSCSI and iSCSID to actually inject stop something into into the kernel. Yes. Um, there is not all that much um, extra checking around. So we, we, um, or I rely on a working kernel that TCP IP is safe. So if I'm opening a connection to a, a, a target, um, that that connection is not intercepted by somebody else. 
Um, the 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 idea is also normally you don't run iSCSID over the internet, um, and if you want to do that, you may sh or or you should use something like uh, IPsec to actually make sure that nobody is is injecting traffic into into your data stream. Um, for vSCSI, the the thing is you need super user privileges to open open that device, and if you have super user privileges, you already can read all the, the, the devices you have on the disk and, and, and fiddle with the kernel and do whatever you want. So um, I think there we are actually safe. Any other question? Hi. What kind of uh, targets did you test against your initiator? Um, I did a lot of work against the NetBSD iSCSI target uh, code. Um, that was mostly doing like being able to work on it on the, on on my laptop. Um, there were people playing around with uh, the FreeNAS um, implementation. Um, I myself now have a TransTech iSCSI disk shelf that I'm 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 using also to to um, that more or less provides a lot of disk space for my server. Um, and this is where I'm actually doing most of the, the, the traffic now on it. Um, apart from that, I haven't... Uh, uh, I know that uh, some people were also using the Solaris um, iSCSI target implementation, um, but not much more, I think. Any other questions? Good. Right. We have to know my questions. Let's let's thank our speaker then.